to uh, understand something, I need to build a model. And that's where I think we're making some progress, and I'm going uh, to describe that progress. And I'm going to try to draw some tentative lessons from what we've learned. And I'm not going to go through the, the details on this, but they say, actually, it looks like we're on the way to recovery. Um, we'll talk about the possibility of a double dip recession uh, when we get towards the end. But, um, but maybe the new data tells us that we uh, were wrong to be panicking. This was the kind of blog that was certainly feeding the sorts of panic that uh, people were feeling last year. Okay, so what's our definition of a Great Depression? I, I've written this down with uh, some equations, but it's very easy to explain. What I'm trying to do is look at deviations from that trend line. So we have where I think the economy can grow. Why 2%? I do not know. So here's just to give you an idea. When I take away the 2% trends, what was happening in the 1930s? in, uh, in uh, major European and North American countries. And we see this kind of drop that occurs fairly quickly. And 20%, whoa, that's just a criterion. For some countries like Canada, uh, it's actually 40%. Then recoveries occur rapidly in some countries. I'm not sure we'd want to follow the German example. That was Adolf Hitler. Uh, and much more slowly in others. France, which didn't have the sharp drop, just still was in the Depression uh, as at the outset of uh, World War II. Here, here are pictures like that for uh, countries in Latin America in the 1980s. Some countries we see, Chile, for example, and I'll come back to the examples of Chile and Mexico. Chile had a much sharper drop at the beginning but then made a quick comeback. Other countries like Mexico and even worse, Argentina, just kind of slowly slid down, downhill. Great depressions, not the current crisis. All of them involve substantial drops in productivity. Some of them, especially the US and German Great Depressions of the 30s, involve something really wrong with the labor market. Massive unemployment that just didn't seem to disappear very quickly. Um, and here's, here's the lesson I'm going to draw, and I'm, trying to go, I'm going to try to be specific on how this applies to the current uh, U.S. and Spanish si situation at the end. But my view is that th there's, a, there's shocks occurring all the time. I'm saying exogenous shocks. Some of them, like the housing bubble, could even be endogenous. But I'm thinking bad things happen. In the case of Chile and Mexico in the early 1980s, they were very sharp deteriorations in their uh, terms of trade and very sharp increases in, uh, in uh, foreign interest rates, in particular the U.S. interest rate that I'm going to be thinking about a little bit later. Something more has to be involved. And I am guessing as a working hypothesis that has to do with government policy. And Mexicans are very hardworking people. But look at this horrible productivity. And then you have to really start thinking about that. It's like this thing with the standard criticism of, uh, of uh, 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 productivity shocks in a real business cycle model. You say, oh, how can productivity go down? People forget things? No. How do things go down? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you my story from Mexico. The government just undertakes policies that systematically pushes resources, workers and capital investment, into inefficient firms, into horrible firms. That's how you d destroy an economy. And that's what the government did in, the, in Mexico in the 1980s. Now, they've been trying not to do that since about 1988, and it hasn't been working so well. And they've been getting economic growth, but nothing spectacular, nothing like the 2% we're looking for. And what we wanted to see is why what happened in Chile was so different than what happened in Mexico. So here's a, here's a methodology that you can tack on to the methodology I talked about before. Try to look at countries that experience similar shocks and see why one did better than the other and see if you can identify the differences with government policy. That's what we tried to do here. 
You can't get anything more different than that. This is what happened in Chile and Mexico, and here I'm detrending by uh, 2%. That just shifts the picture up and down. You're going to get the same difference. Chile had a crisis that it started out worse, but my gosh. Uh, Chile, starting in the end of 1984, became one of the fastest growing countries in the world. And uh, Mexico just stagnated. Now, I'm doing two things differently than you'll see uh, journalists and some economists doing. I'm always dividing by the number of people. That's really important for countries like this. Mexico had population growth at the beginning of this. They're going through a demographic shift now of 3.5% per year. So at that point, if Mexico was only growing by 2%, everybody was getting poorer. I'm also taking out the 2% trend. That is far less important. The big thing is divided by the number of people. So I'm going to calibrate this model. Um, and actually, what I'm going to do, usually I calibrate the beta, or we could call this estimation, but it's actually just a simple nonlinear root squares estimation, in order to replicate what's going on during relatively stable periods. So we look at 60 to 80. And we imputed what taxes would have to look like to get the investment uh, consumption trade-off. And we look at uh, what labor supply and consumption are to get gamma, right? And gamma is just that uh, utility weight that tells us uh, the uh, labor leisure trade-off. Sticking into this model, just productivity, and if you'd remember back to what my productivity pictures were, Mexican pro productivity is so bad that when we stick these productivity patterns into the, and Chile productivity is not that great, when we stick that into the model, we get kind of the difference, but we miss the levels. Then we stick the taxes in. Oh my gosh. Did I do this right, or did I get the dotted lines and the solid lines mixed up? <laughs> You know, they look so similar, I can never remember what's the model and what's the data. It's a, a joke? Okay. <laughs> Nearly all the differences in the recoveries in Mexico and Chile come from different paths of productivities. Tax reforms are important and, in fact, necessary to explain some features of the recoveries, not the differences. Implications for studying different stories about what is causing the the difference is, is that we need to look at reforms as those that show up in productivities, not as differences in factor inputs. They also have to get the timing right. So then we go through all kinds of stories. There were fiscal reforms in both countries. Yeah, we've already said they're important, but not for the differences. We've already gotten enough as we possibly could out of those. Trade reforms, and those of you who know me know that with my... Uh, my friend Jaime Serra from Mexico, who came to me, uh, came with me into, into, to, to Spain in 1984-85 to start working uh, on uh, Spanish integration into the European community. He was uh, he was the Secretary of Trade and uh, Industry in uh, Mexico, who negotiated the NAFTA with the United States, and I was his economic advisor. And we thought the secret to getting growth going again in Mexico was going to be trade reform. Well, we got a lot of increases in trade, but it didn't seem to work in getting things going. 